we're going to talk about error bars. And to talk about error bars, we're going to use error bars. These chocolate bars, I don't think you get them in the US. We certainly have them in the UK. I've eaten a lot of this chocolate in my time. It's full of bubbles. Bubbly, delicious goodness. <laughs> so we're gonna actually melt the bubbles. Well, we're gonna melt the chocolate. And we're gonna do it because we're gonna measure the speed of light with chocolate. This is an experiment that's you go anywhere on the internet, you can find lots and lots of people talking about this experiment. Lots of people have done this experiment in the past. It's not so much the experiment itself. What we're actually doing this for is to put across the key importance of experimental uncertainties and experimental error bars. And I can almost feel the waves of disgust as undergraduate students who might be watching this or any students who might be watching this because Error bars in first year are something that we spend so much time teaching students about. And let's be honest, they're not the most exciting aspect of the science, but they are absolutely key. Because if you quote a result without quoting an error bar, you're not even wrong, if I can paraphrase Pauli. Without that error bar, nobody knows what your uncertainties are. Nobody knows how well you did the experiment. You can't compare your result with any other experiments. So what we're going to do with this chocolate is we're going to put it in this microwave, sitting in this fume cupboard. Um, I should note that the reason we've got the fume cupboard and we've got our smoke detector covered up is that earlier today when I was preparing this experiment, I attempted to do it in my office and I didn't cover up the smoke detector and the alarm went off in the building and hundreds of people were evacuated. Um, that it, was, it was an, a big deal. It was a big deal. It was a big embarrassing deal and the security people were not happy with me. It's a bit like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, isn't it? Look at that. Is there a gold? No. Okay. Right. That's what it looks like. But we're actually going to, we're going to use this side. Some of you will have seen this experiment, but for those of you who haven't, what we're going to do is we're going to put it in here. We're going to heat it up and it will melt, if the experiment works, in specific places. And the places in which it melts are directly related to the wavelength of the microwaves. So what's absolutely key, if anybody does want to do this, is you normally have a little rotating thing, the little um, spindle, that's the word, spindle, that sits in here that rotates the, the plate round and rotates the food round. We don't want that. We want it to sit in one place and to be bombarded so it doesn't, doesn't move around because that will disturb the pattern. Anything Not else? that I can see anything. We might have to do this again. Let's see where we are and whether we've got any. Oh, oh no. <laughs> yes, it's definitely worked. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, okay, one last try. melting it already. There we go. One, two, three. Actually, that was, that was 20 seconds. <laughs> now it's going to take five minutes, of course. Right. So. It's, the mess. it's the, yeah, it's just a mess. You can't really see anything. Bollocks. Oh, it smells delicious. Mm -hmm. It's, it's worked out okay, about as, as, as well as the, the experiment works. It's a very good experiment to demonstrate this real importance of uncertainties because so often in science there's this idea that, you know, science proves this and science proves that and everything's so exact, it's not. So they went in the microwave and they were blasted for various times between 10 seconds and up to 30 seconds. And as you can see, sometimes well, decent imprints were formed and then other times it sort of uh, formed a bit of a splodge. In the microwave oven, you've got waves of electromagnetic radiation, and it's those waves that are giving rise to the heating, of course. Where you have peaks in the electromagnetic radiation, which are called antinodes, you get a lot of um, power injected into the chocolate, and hence it melts. So what we're seeing, this pattern we're seeing, is an imprint of the standing wave pattern in the, the microwave oven. Normally, if food spins round on that spindle, we disabled that spindle because what we wanted was the opposite of what you normally want in your food. You don't want localized hotspots. We wanted localized hotspots because those hotspots tell us about the microwaves and the distribution and the pattern of microwaves in the oven. 
So the distance between the peaks within the oven, that is half a wavelength. Because that is half that. That's a wavelength is where the whole cycle repeats. This is half a wavelength. That's all we need. That's, that, that's really, we need that and we need one other um, equation, which I'll put in the microwave down here, which is this. The speed of light is equal to frequency of the microwaves times the wavelength. Frequency f, let's write it up here, is 2.45 gigahertz. I know that because it's written on the back of the microwave oven. So the important thing is that the, the peaks here between these tell us lambda over two, tell us the wavelength divided by two. So if we measure the distance between these, uh, okay, so that's about eight, six, about seven. Okay, so we've got three, three measurements. We'd like to have more, that's the first thing. But what's the best thing to do here? Let's take an average. So we've got eight centimeter, six centimeter, and seven centimeter would seem that the best thing to do would take an average here. So let's say seven centimeters. That gives us a wavelength of 14 centimeters. So C is equal to F times 14 centimeters. F we know is 2.45 gigahertz because we read that off the back of the microwave by 14 centimeters. So we want the speed of light, which is C, which is in meters per second. So let's make sure we get, we're careful with our units. So that's 2.45, a giga is 10 to the nine hertz by, in terms of meters, that's 0 0.14 meters. What we have is C, 3.4, so 0 0.343, so that's 0 0.343. We could, for the physicists among you, I know in terms of significant figures, but let's keep going. So C, her result is 3.43 by 10 to the eight meters per second. That's the speed of light. That's the speed of light as determined by chocolate. That's not good, is it? Because we know what the speed of light is and it's pretty damn close to three by 10 to the eight meters per second. Well, I think that's, considering if you, so it's actually three and you've got 3.4. Yeah, on the basis of chocolate. I think that's pretty good. How do we know? Good compared to what? So can we really quote to the 4.43? How many of those figures are, are valid or significant? Or any of those figures significant? Sometimes we do experiments to try and, um, <sighs> check a previous value and then often we do experiments because we're reaching out into the unknown. How do we know? Could you do another hundred of them? Another thousand of them? We could definitely do another thousand of them but still then how do we know even after those a thousand? How do we know? Well how do you know anything? Exactly so what we have to think about as this this value is quoted we're not right, we're not wrong, we're not even right, we're not even wrong. We can do nothing with this value because we don't know what the experimental uncertainty is. We don't know how well we've done the experiment. We don't know how many of those figures are significant. We don't know, you know, can we measure to the second decimal place, to the fifth decimal place? We don't know. So we find that our value ranges from 12 through 14 to 16. So our value is 14. The best way to quote is that we have lambda is equal to 14 plus or minus two centimeters, right? How does that translate into how we quote our value for the speed of light? So we know we've got this value, this error in, or in lambda. So what we say is we would typically, you can either do a big delta or a little delta. Typically we call it a, a little delta. I'll do a big delta because my handwriting is absolutely terrible. So delta lambda is equal to plus or minus two centimeters or actually we'll just leave the plus or minus out. Delta lambda is two centimeters, that's our error bar. So what we find is C, or what we know is C is equal to F times lambda. We're gonna assume, because it's written on the back of the microwave, that the frequency, we, we've just got, we've got no idea how, you know, what error there might be on that, so we're just gonna assume that it's a given value, that we don't know what the error is, so we're just gonna treat it as without an error. It's, it's a value we've been handed down. What we need to do is work out the error in C, depending on the error in lambda. But the problem is, well, C is meters per second, and lambda is meters. And we can't compare, we can't just go, this is um, centimeters, then 
uh, we need a, a value in meters per second. So what do we do here? Well, what we have to do is look at something called the percentage error or the relative error. So what we know is that delta C, the error in C in the speed of light over C is equal to delta lambda over lambda. This is just basically percentages. That's all we're doing. We're, we're expressing our error in C as a percentage of C, and that percentage, the percentage error in C will be the same as the percentage error in lambda, because we're assuming this doesn't have an error. All right? So delta C over C is equal to 2 centimetres over 14 centimetres. Right? So our percentage error in C is about, well, is 1 over 7. That implies our error in C, delta C, is 1 over 7 times our value of C, which was 3.43 by 10 to the 8. So if we work that through, work out what 1 seventh of 3.43 is, 0 0.49 by 10 to the 8. Now, the standard approach, and as long as we all stick to this, then everybody can compare the results, is that we quote to one significant figure, or if you're a bit more careful and you can justify it like they do in, NAS in the National Physical Lab or in NIST, maybe two significant figures. We're going to do what um, is done in first year labs across the world, and we're going to quote that to one significant figure. So that means our final result for the speed of light is, we've quoted this to one decimal place, so we need to get this to agree. So we'll get rid of the, 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 the three, the second decimal place. With our putting our error bar in place, the value of C, the speed of light from our experiment, falls somewhere between 2.9 and 3.9 by 10 to the eight meters per second. Now we can compare that to the speed of light, we really shouldn't because that's not how you do experimental science because it biases you in one direction. We should try and do this as objectively as possible without being skewed but we know in terms of comparing that to the speed of light that we've done a pretty good job because the actual speed of light falls within the error bar. The problem is, and too often and we have to correct this time and time and time again in undergraduate labs, the error bar, the experimental error, is not the difference of the, the value that, that 3.4 from the speed of light. That's not how you do it. It's not like it's a mistake. An error is not a mistake. There's, a, there's an inbuilt uncertainty in our measurements. And there's an inbuilt uncertainty in every single measurement we take. It doesn't matter if it's to the nth decimal place, to the 10th, the 15th, the 20th decimal place. No matter how precise you get, you're never going to be so precise that you're infinitesimally precise. Universe will be upside down. And when he's trapped there, his mum is, you know, really worried about him, but she figures out that he's not missing and that actually she can communicate with him when he's in this parallel universe.